Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy. Uh, today we've got a very delicate topic uh, for this episode. It's about transgenderism. Uh, as you know, on The Common Bridge, we strive to hear from all perspectives, and we've got many invites out. We're going to hear from one perspective today with our guest, Lior, Lior Sapir. Lior, welcome to The Common Bridge. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Rich. Throughout history, there's been practices of gender switching. Um, you know, sometimes at a time of more defined gender roles as, uh, you know, well, as occasionally some dual gendered or non gendered people throughout history. It's very rare, but it's happened. You know, since the beginning of humankind and perhaps against their will, uh, we had the eunuchs. And in recent times, Caitlyn Jenner, uh, movies back in the 1950s, Glenn or Glenda, uh, Myra Breckenridge, and here in Michigan, Consider the Oyster at the famous Purple Rose Theater. So as we take on this most controversial and difficult topic, we invite uh, anyone with a perspective to please uh, let us know if you'd like to be on the show, we'd like to have you. Um, and this issue is emerging at a time when deplatforming, censoring, doxing, and other forms of hate have become tech-enabled weapons of stifling dissenting viewpoints and dissenting facts. So. Looking for the middle ground, I want to start the discussion with our guest, Mr. Sapir, uh, by suggesting as elements that we can all agree that everyone desires a society and a world that is marked with compassion and kindness for everyone. Freedom of choice and freedom of expression for all competent adults. Freedom of violence and harm for everyone. Freedom from violence and freedom from harm and that children are precious, vulnerable, and must be nurtured. And finally, a shared commitment to science and truth, however inconvenient or adverse to one's political view it might be. Lior, welcome to The Common Bridge, and our audience likes to know a little bit about our guests, so if you don't mind, where did you spend some of your early days? What's your education and career arc been like? And what are you up to today? Sure. So <clears throat> I uh, got a PhD in political science at Boston College. And um, I decided to write, I was very interested in um, American politics, political theory, um, and especially the role of the courts in our policy process. Um, and right around the time I was looking for a dissertation topic, the Obama administration handed down an administrative, an administrative guidance document uh, telling schools that as a condition of receiving federal funds, they had to defer to how students identify themselves as male or female rather than um, their actual sex as male or female. And I thought that this was very interesting, especially because the Obama administration claimed, um, number one, that um, this was always the law. They weren't doing anything new. Um, which was, uh, I very quickly found out, uh, uh, pretty easy to show that that wasn't the case. Um, but number two, and I think more relevant to our purposes here, um, the administration did this without providing any explanation um, for what human sex differences are based on and why. It just asserted that a person's gender identity, uh, didn't even define the term in a coherent way, um, that a person's gender identity is what makes them male or female. Um, and so I set about for the next uh, few years trying to understand, uh, you know, using this episode to understand how our system of government works. And I very quickly became um, uh, embroiled in these controversies over medicine. Um, because by and large, both the federal courts and the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education were relying on medical rationales 
and deferring to medical associations. Um, and towards the end of my doctoral work um, and into my postdoctoral work at Harvard, um, I started really looking into uh, mostly tracing the footnotes and the citations, but uh, looking into the, to the research behind um, so-called gender affirming care. Um, and I found that it's really based on very little evidence. Um, the evidence for it is extremely weak and unreliable, um, but it was being presented to the public as settled science. Um, and and uh, critics or even just skeptics, um, people who were just raising questions about this new experimental protocol, were being cast aside as uh, bigots, um, anti-science, transphobic. Um, and I thought that this was a very unhealthy way uh, to try to devise a new uh, medical protocol, especially one uh, that that uh, you know deals with children um, who are in uh, various stages of development, who are vulnerable. Um, and so in the last few years, I've been focusing pretty much exclusively um, on the medical science question of pediatric gender medicine, but with obvious um, uh, overlap to the legal and policy landscape, because I think that it's very difficult to separate those things, especially in, in, in the United States. Maybe in other countries, it might be a little bit easier. So that's generally by way of background. You know, People constantly ask me, you're not a medical doctor. Why should we listen to you? Um, and my answer to that is, you know, I'm not speaking as a medical doctor. I'm not giving diagnoses. I'm not giving medical advice. Um, what I'm doing is basically look, examining the evidence that medical associations themselves cite in support of their protocols. And if there is uh, clear evidence that what they cite is uh, doesn't support their own conclusions, um, you don't have to be a doctor to appreciate, for example, that a study that has no control group um, it's impossible to make any causal claims about a particular treatment and uh, whether it works or doesn't work. Um, so I try to help people understand um, what these studies did and did not do, what the strength of the evidence is, and why it is that over the last few years, um, American medical associations have doubled or tripled down on a medical protocol that other countries, including very progressive European countries, have um, in a serious way started to back away from. Yeah, and, and I think what's particularly interesting about this entire notion um, is how many of the guardrails in society uh, have been cast aside uh, in pursuit of a conclusion. Um, and I want to make it clear that we're talking about uh, children here um, in that in our uh, look at this, a competent adult can make a competent adult decision. Um, and I've known people that have done that. And, you know, there's been some good results and some other result. Um, and then there are infants that, you know, are born with uh, indeterminate genitalia or um, hermaphroditism and such. And that is a small percentage, but we need to be able to treat that medically and uh, compassionately. Uh, but when we're looking at the medicalization of young people, um, some things that seem to be tossed to the side, like the age of consent. Um, you need your ear pierced. You have to be, I think, over 12 or have a, a parent uh, a, get a tattoo. Hey, that's permanent. You've got to be over 21. Uh, beer, in some places even coffee, um, consenting to sex, joining the military, buying a, a gun, voting, seeing an R-rated movie. We set limits on this. And just over the weekend, I'm reading a story about a 14-year-old uh, mass murderer planned and shot two people at a school. Um, the debate was whether that young man should be released from prison. Um, and one of his proponents said, uh, at his age, his brain is about as developed as a turnip, and that it really you can't make decisions like that until you're 25. And I thought to myself, if you could be a depraved killer to shoot a six-year-old at the age of 14, but somehow you're going to mature out of that, this idea that you could be 10 years old and make a decision about gender just doesn't seem to fit. But what am I missing here? Well, uh, Rich, you're, you're raising probably the most controversial aspect of this debate, um, which is to what extent do kids have the ability to uh, consent um, or even just basically understand, um, grasp 
the gravity of the decision that they are trying to make. You know, I, I've spoken with adults, including transsexual adults, they prefer sometimes to be called transsexual, not transgender, um, who say, uh, you know, that going through puberty as hard as it was allowed them to mature into adults who can have kids who are fertile, who can have kids who are sexually functional, um, and that this is a very important part of their lives and their lives would be miserable without their kids. Um, and so, uh, but of course, as kids, if you had asked a 12 or 13 or 14 year old version of them, um, do you, do you think that you really want to be a parent in the future? They would have said, ew, um, because what kid that age wants to have uh, children of their own, right? Um, it's not even remotely within, uh, the, the, the spectrum of things that kids care about. Um, but let me say just a few things about this question of consent, which I think is, uh, again, is, is obviously central here. Um, the first is that what sometimes activists like to say is that the kids who are agreeing to these treatments are providing assent and not consent, um, meaning the fully informed consent is actually given by their parents, not by them themselves. Um, they assent to it, meaning they agree to it, but they don't provide the, the kind of legally um, relevant basis for uh, medical interventions. Uh, we can get to what that means. We can get to why that consent by parents is, um, to say the least, uh, questionable under the current uh, affirmative protocol as it's practiced in the United States. But I, I would just put that on the table. Um, the second thing that I think it's important to understand is that <clears throat> unlike uh, you know, getting a tattoo um, or drinking beer or driving a car, um, according to advocates of the affirmative care model of treatment, you know, these are not uh, elective treatments. These are medically necessary, um, and as they now like to say, life-saving, because uh, they, they invoke the idea that uh, kids will kill themselves if, they don't, if they're not given these interventions, uh, meaning it's a medically necessary intervention for a medical condition. And of course, a kid doesn't have to agree to having a medical condition in order for to be diagnosed with that condition. Um, so in other words, what they're doing is they're using an approach that emphasizes the clinical benefits of these interventions, as opposed to an approach that we see is much more common among adults um, that relies on informed consent. Um, right? If you want to get, if you're, you know, if you want to get a um, a boob job. Um, you don't have to prove that it's going to, as a, as a mature woman, you don't have to prove that it's, uh, that, that there are clinical benefits associated with getting uh, enhanced breasts. Um, it's your choice. And as long as you are appraised of the risks, of the health risks involved, you can give informed consent. But, it's, but, but at the same time, we recognize that that's a cosmetic procedure. It's not. Well, there's, a, there's two things about, the, about that. First of all, informed consent means there needs to be a medical standard of care. And my understanding with these gender affirming treatments, as they're called, um, that there is not a standard of care. Um, breast augmentation, the first question the plastic surgeon is going to ask is, what's your expectation of this surgery? And they're screening to make sure that there's a correct or a reasonable psychological expectation. And versus um, when I, my understanding, of, of the youth is that, if, first of all, that we can't figure out what the parent's responsibility is. And, you, you know, kids are raised, look, if an adult is trying to tell you, don't tell a secret, that's generally somebody that's not interested in your uh, best welfare. Um, look at all the situations we've had with the priests abusing children and such. That was a secret to be kept from the parents. Um Okay, let me, you put a lot on the table, Rich. I, I do want to kind of go, go back a little bit um, because there was one additional aspect of the consent question, which I think is absolutely vital um, and maybe the most important of the three that I was going to mention. Um, and then we can get back to standards of care. We can get back to social transition, which includes pronouns and all these kinds of things. Um, I think at the heart of the argument for gender affirmative drugs and surgeries is the notion of the transgender child. And what I mean by that is the idea that being transgender is something that you can be born as and that this type of knowledge that I am in fact transgender um, is available to human beings from a very early age. Um, you, you know, it's not uncommon nowadays to, to uh, read uh, articles, including in peer-reviewed journals, um, claiming that kids as young as two years old can know that they're transgender. 
Um, and so uh, if you accept the notion that some kids simply are trans in the same way that some kids are gay, some kids are left-handed, some kids are tall, um, some kids are dark-skinned, some, are, are, some kids are light-skinned, and so on and so forth, if you accept that it's just a natural category of human life, um, it's very hard to then uh, see why we shouldn't give transgender medicine to transgender children. Right, so the, the the practical consequence of accepting the notion of the transgender child is to reverse the burden of proof that normally exists in medical ethics. Because usually in medicine, um, if you are going to uh, uh, intervene in the human body, either with drugs or surgeries, or even with psychotherapy, um, there has to be a pretty compelling reason for you to do so. That's the practical consequence of taking seriously the oath to first do no harm. Right. Um, so usually the burden of justification is on those uh, advocating for certain treatments um, or certain interventions, I, sh I should say, as treatments. But if you accept the notion of the transgender child um, and if it seems intuitive to you that transgender children should get transgender medicine, then the practical consequence of that is really to flip the burden of proof. So that now it's the burden of proof is on people like me to explain why transgender children should not receive transgender treatments, treatments that we give readily to transgender adults. So at the heart of this debate, I think, is the concept of the transgender child and the question questions about and, and, and you know, further than that, um, uh, philosophical questions about what is gender identity? Do all human beings really have it? How do we know that we have it? And uh, these are very complicated questions. But I think it's enough uh, right here just to point out that um, um, we don't have evidence, uh, put it this way, we don't have evidence that, that, tr that some kids are just born transgender. Um, let's start there. Um, I well, think let's, 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 let's unwrap that a little bit because early on you mentioned where is the control group. And again, I'm setting aside the, the, percentage of babies that are born with indeterminate genitalia or they might have gonads and uh, a, a uterus or this happens okay and these are things that clearly call for some uh, medical review and or medical intervention I'm talking about um, what we used to say here is a boy or here is a girl not that's your sex assigned at birth but you mentioned a control group because if this has been a problem for so long, where are the 50 year old 60 year old 70 year old there should be a large cadre coming to the fore saying yes i was transgender but i i didn't have affirming care available to me and it's ruined my life and i'm listening for them and to date i have not seen any evidence that there is a group of people out there that believe they missed the window to change their gender identity Am I missing something? Is there something out there in the literature that says that there is a control group? Well, I think you're definitely right to point out that we would expect to see a much larger presence in public discourse of uh, older adults who say, you know, if only I had these procedures available to me, um, my life would have been immeasurably better. Um, you know, uh, these individuals do exist, but I, we also have uh, a lot of older, uh, again, I use the word transsexual because that's usually the word that they use. They don't like the word transgender. They recognize it as kind of a, a new linguistic shift that um, brings in a lot of phenomena that they think is um, completely irrelevant and even harmful to, to what they regard as, as uh, appropriate medical care. But so let's leave that aside. Let's just um, use the term that they prefer. A lot of these older transgender, transsexual adults, they, they recognize the fact that, you know, again, having kids, having their sexual organs and functions intact, um, uh, coming out of puberty with their bodies um, not having been flooded with synthetic hormones, not having had their breasts amputated or their penises inverted into neo-vaginas and so on and so forth, um, that this has actually been uh, really a, a real blessing to their lives, um, especially the, their ability to, to have kids and to have a family of their own. And I think to, to the extent that they know anything about pediatric gender medicine, they probably know that kids who go through these drugs and procedures from a very early age, from right around the cusp of puberty at Tanner stage two, um, are unlikely to emerge from adolescence with their organs and functions intact. And I think that a lot of these older transsexuals recognize that at the very least, there's a real dilemma here. 
Um, but uh, I think a lot of them are, are actually against uh, pediatric uh, sex changes for exactly the reasons that I outlined. But, you know, again, g getting back to the question of, of the transgender child, um, transgender is not a natural category. It's a social and political one. Um, it's, uh, uh, you could say that, that the natural category here or the clinical category would be something like gender dysphoria or gender incongruence. Um, and there's a debate within the clinical literature about whether, for example, um, a very small subset of the population has a brain that is uh, structurally and functionally typical of the opposite sex, right? The so-called brain sex hypothesis. Um, and that transsexuals are by definition those who have the brain structure and function of the opposite sex. This is a controversial theory. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a lively scientific debate about uh, whether, whether it's true or false. Um, but regardless, in th for the modern transgender movement, and certainly for advocates of pediatric gender medicine, it almost doesn't matter. Um, and I say that because nobody is demanding MRI scans on the brains of children in order to determine whether they really are trans. Under the affirmative protocol, especially the one practiced in the United States, um, as opposed to the one increasingly common in Europe, um, the, the medical protocol starts from the assumption that kids know who they are, specifically trans kids know who they are from a very early age, from as young as age two or three, these kids can know that they are transgender. And by that, I mean that they are going to have a, a full human life as transgender, not just going through a phase. Um, and so, you know, it, it becomes a, a, a kind of dogmatic ideological assertion um, unproven and unprovable in principle. Um, and one doesn't have to prove these things. I mean, if you, if you uh, peer into the circles of advocacy, um, including uh, doctors, mental health professionals who practice these things, um, you'll see them take it as a, just an article of faith that some kids are just transgender and that um, one can have intuitive knowledge, or, or as they like to call it, lived experience, which is not objectively... Um, verifiable through any tools of scientific analysis or, or diagnosis, as opposed, for example, to what you were mentioning earlier, the intersex or uh, conditions or uh, disorders of sex development. These are objective conditions that can be diagnosed objectively without just relying on a patient's say-so. But in the case of transgenderism, that's that's just not true. Um, well, uh, and to, yeah. that, to that degree about trying to put a diagnosis on it, in any other uh, diagnosis, the way that you might get to a diagnosis of uh, gender dysphoria or transgenderism, transsexualism, I, I want to be sensitive to the right um, uh, nomenclature, you'd rule out everything else. And there's been two quite solid studies now with an undeniable link between autism and people that believe that they are of the opposite gender. Um, the number of uh, comorbidities of mental health conditions with people that think that they are in the wrong body is st stark. Um, there is no study that I've been able to locate that says suicides and suicidal ideation is better post these massive medical interventions. Um, and, and in fact, you know, sometimes, you know, threatening suicide is, uh, uh, is emotional blackmail um, in, in all circumstances, um, that the social influence uh, that we are seeing is not a factor. You know, do you have any friends that say they're, you know, gender fluid or are of the opposite? You know, how about the other people in your, your uh, class? And then, of course, there are, you know, parents that um, want to have a, a facetious disorder uh, imposed on their child. They get attention for it. Um, it seems to me that there's a lot to rule out before one comes into a life-changing diagnosis. Um, you know, so giving uh, credence that there are going to be a certain number of people, okay, let's, let's stipulate that that might be possible, but let's rule out everything else and see what can be treated before going to the big gun medicalization of minors. That's right. And so what you're referring to is known as differential diagnosis. Um, and that occurs in every area of medicine. Um, so, you know, if you go to the doctor and you say, hey, doctor, my back hurts, um, I think it might be the first symptom of cancer. 
um, the doctor is not just going to say, well, cancer people know who they are. Um, they're going to do differential diagnosis, rule out other things that might be causing a symptom that is known to be common in certain types of back cancer, right? Um, so, so we do differential diagnosis. Now, of course, in mental health, um, you know, it's tricky sometimes to do, di- uh, 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 in, in psychiatry, it's difficult, difficult sometimes to do differential diagnosis because you're, you're treating um, uh, you know, diseases of the mind and, and um, you can't exactly just do a biopsy. Um, Oh, in other words, um, so so yes, there has to be differential diagnosis, and I, you know one of the points that I've been trying to make um, in my writings and my research, and to convey to to policymakers and especially to the medical community, is that the affirmative model that has been uh, that has taken root in the United States, um, if you want to kind of reduce it down to a slogan, it's basically no differential diagnosis. We don't do that because differential diagnosis entails prolonged intensive psychotherapy where you don't just take a person's trans identification or desire to escape their body at face value but you in fact you know you set it aside and you say okay i hear that you that you feel like you are the opposite sex but let's try to to talk a little bit about your history your other mental health issues um, let's do a comprehensive assessment to see if there might be something else that's driving you to think about yourself in these terms and to think that your life will be much, much better um, if, you, if you take these drugs and surgeries. Um, you, you, know, you might think that that kind of psychotherapy first, um, intensive psychotherapy first approach is absolutely common sense and it's the least invasive way to treat kids uh, in distress in these circumstances. And in fact, that is what European health authorities are now recommending. But the affirmative model, as endorsed by American Medical Association, says that that form of uh, exploratory therapy, um, they've called it conversion therapy. Um, And in doing so, they're borrowing a term that has been used in another context, a context that um, you know, is is uh, if you're thinking about this as uh, as a scientist would, is unrelated to the context of gender identity development. And I'm I'm referring, of course, to homosexuality. Um, you know, in, in American p- political culture, uh, uh, partly for strategic reasons, um, the T has been lumped together with the LGB as if it's all part of the exact same phenomena. Um, but in fact, these are very very different things. Um, and it is true that in the context of homosexuality. Efforts to use um, psychotherapy or even harsher means to get um, people who are same-sex attracted to not be same-sex attracted anymore are almost always futile and worse than futile. They're almost always very damaging. Um, and so they're, they're greatly discouraged. But the, all of the available research that we have on childhood gender identity development shows that the vast majority of kids with cross-gender ident- identification desist from it by early adulthood. And that puberty itself appears to be the factor that um, that, that helps clarify a person's uh, um, sexual identity to themselves, um, and that more often than not, with psychotherapy, they can come to terms with their body, um, and they won't feel like they need to uh, to, to undergo risky transition um, in order to be who who they uh, who they think that they are. So yeah, so, so I would say th- the affirmative model is really at odds with differential diagnosis. And this is not, you know, just uh, me making inferences. The American Academy of Pediatrics in 2018 published a position paper that explicitly said any approach, any psychotherapeutic approach that does not automatically and uncritically affirm, meaning agree with, a child's self-diagnosis of being trans is conversion therapy. This is a wildly irresponsible position to take. All of the evidence that they cited in that position paper actually supports the opposite hypothesis. Um, That paper was written by a single medical doctor who was still in his residency and had virtually no clinical experience. He himself reviewed his own paper. So it's, it's a position undertaken by the American Academy of Pediatrics on the basis of one inexperienced doctor with virtually no input from the wider medical community. Um... And in the paper itself, they say Dr. Jason Rafferty, who's the author of the paper, is accountable uh, for for this position statement, but he has not been able, he's not been, sorry, excuse me, willing to respond to or engage with critics ever since 2018. Um, So it's a policy ungrounded in any scientific evidence, 
that has no guardrails or safeguards, uh, as you put it earlier, and for which the AAP has been completely unaccountable to the, to the public and to its own members. And, and I can see where the, the momentum starts with, um, we, we're not going through normal diagnostic procedures. And you know the difference between a, a person that is born um, as a homosexual and discovers that as their awareness increases, um, they, they could be a man who uh, is attracted to and loves men, but he's still a man. He's still not trying to medically change his body. Or similarly with the, with a woman that's attracted. And you know, as we've seen that people do change over time, they are people that are bisexual and asexual that um, at different periods of their life or who might come in and out of their lives, they may change uh, who they're attracted to or who they're in love with. But they remain their own biology versus something that's been contorted. That's part of the problem is that we've now, you know, uh, sex used to mean something very specific. And then the term gender entered into the lexicon for a variety of cultural reasons. Um, and now, you know, the, the, the trans movement over the last 10, 15 years has conflated sex and gender so that um, now we use the two interchangeably. Um, there are two sexes. There's disorders of sex development, but there are two sexes. Um, gen there are no genders. Um, that doesn't exist. Um, gender refers to social and psychological understandings of sex. And so in that regard, you can say that different cultures have different understandings of sex, and that's inarguably true. But it doesn't mean that there are more than two sexes, and it certainly doesn't mean that there's more than two genders, unless, again, you're conflating the two terms. Um, and then gender identity, you know, what exactly is that? Well, that's a person's core sense of gender, but, but again, what is gender? So you come back to say, you have to come back to saying it's a person's core conception of their own sex. Well, that core conception can either be true or false, um, but it can't s replace, it can't supplant a person's sex. Um, well, yeah. when, so when you think about this, we, we have a, a, a diagnostic and treatment protocols for everything else. We have the Hippocratic Oath about doing no harm. And we seem to be breaking through all of those guardrails and, and and checkpoints, who profits from this? There's got it. I mean, so why is this being pushed so vigorously? And you know that uh, so much noise around it. And and look, I will tell you also part of my research in preparing for this talk today. There's really well funded uh, not for profits out there that are clear advocates. To ask no questions, get to surgery as quick as we can. Why? Any sense for that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I get this question a lot. You know, I think Americans understandably, especially coming on the heels of the um, OxyContin and uh, scandal opioid epidemic, where there were, you know, uh, big pharma companies, Purdue Pharma, for example, uh, uh, standing to gain huge profits from getting Americans addicted to painkillers. Um, I think there's there's uh, uh, understandable suspicion towards drug companies, um, maybe less so towards hospitals, but certainly towards drug companies, um, and to some extent maybe insurance companies as well. And I, and I understand that and I'm sympathetic to that. Um, but I think in this particular case, in the case of pediatric gender medicine, I haven't seen evidence that con that would convince me that the profit motive is the main driver. It is a factor, but I don't think it's the main factor of why these protocols, why these procedures have sp have taken root and spread so quickly um, uh, and so thoroughly, uh, I think by far and away the most important factor is ideological. Um, I, I think that a lot of the doctors who are doing this and the medical associations who are deferring to small and very vocal groups of activists from within their own ranks are not doing it for profit necessarily, or at least not primarily, they're doing it uh, because they, they, they've drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak. They, they believe wholeheartedly in the notion of the transgender child. Um, they believe wholeheartedly that, um, that these interventions are safe and that the clinical benefits are, if not proven, then at least um, extremely likely, um, and that the risks are minimal if, uh, if, if they exist at all. And I think they, they have um, merged in their minds They've merged a medical protocol with a civil rights cause to such an extent that they cannot even 
um, think about these two issues separately. They cannot, you know, anytime they think about um, pediatric gender medicine, they're thinking about the, the newest civil rights frontier. And anytime they're thinking about the, new, the newest civil rights frontier, they're thinking about trans kids. So I, I think that the, the driving factors here are primarily ideological. I think profit probably does play a role, um, but I think we need to know a lot more about um, exactly what type, uh, how much profit um, and what types of, uh, you know, liability risks um, insurers and, um, and, and hospitals are, are, are accruing here. Um, there's just a lot we don't know about the, the, the whole uh, uh, in, in industry side of this, the profit side of this, before we can come to the conclusion that it's similar to other medical scandals like OxyContin. Well, you, you know, you, when you talk about the um, civil rights frontier, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably leaning libertarian here, but look at an adult that wants to dress any way they want to, you know, great. Um a, a you know man wants to wear a dress. A woman wants to wear something that is uh, typically identified with men. You know, fine. Um, the notion of going over into a space that should be safe for women, um, you know, dressing rooms and so forth with you know men that are both biologically male and behaving that way. Okay, I make that distinction. Um, is grossly unfair to women and to girls, um, as is a uh, an athlete competing um, th with biological women that has been through um, male puberty, um, and even you know Caitlyn Jenner, who was a you know, world class athlete, saying, "Yeah, that's that's just not right. That's just not fair." Um, I think people can see the common um, sense in this. Um, but but that but that civil rights, you know, I'll defend any adult, any competent adult's right to dress and behave any way they choose with the proviso it doesn't infringe on the rights of another person, period. Yes, and, and I think most Americans share your sentiment. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not supposed yeah. to, uh, societies need to look out for the most vulnerable, and the most vulnerable often are children. Um, you know, and when I see items getting co-flated, like, oh, people don't like drag shows. Look, they've been around forever. You know, the Kabuki Theater, you know, in Japan. I mean, it's just, it, but do we need them in a first grade classroom? That to me is getting down to ideology. Now, um, Leo, neither one of us are doctors, but uh, I've worked in medical records and I understand eh, a little bit. I have no clinical chops at all. Uh, a little bit of the um, lingo, and I, obviously you're well studied. The realities of the surgery um, don't seem to live up to the promise, and they're fraught with risks. Um, what what do you know about that, or what are you comfortable sharing? Uh, I don't know too much about you know the 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 full spectrum of complications, how common they are, um, you know. To what ex how, how they can best be managed, um, how they factor into mental health. You know, what I can say is that um, we do know that, that the risk of complications is relatively high. Um, I've seen figures somewhere in the range of 25 to 70 percent um, complications from, especially from genital surgery. Um, I should mention that genital surgeries do happen in minors, but they are extremely rare, um, but they do happen. They, their numbers have been increasing. Um, double mastectomies, radical double mastectomies for teenage girls are far more common and increasing in numbers. Um, and there too, you know, there's complications. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, the risk of complication is as high as genital surgeries, but it is still uh, a surgery um, and there are definitely complications. Um, so we know that the rate of complications is high. Um, we also know that um, from anecdotal stories of detransitioners. And so these are young men and women who have undergone these surgeries, um, sometimes as minors, sometimes as um, teenage adults, meaning, you know, age 18, 19, um, and have uh, very quickly come to regret it, um, that their stories are, are harrowing. You know, um, they, they have um, severe uh, medical problems. Um, 
Uh, I'm not just talking about you know sexual dysfunction. It's sometimes even things like just continence um, and um, and you know constant and uh, pain, um, uh, excruciating pain. Um, so these are complications that they have to live with, with for the rest of their lives. Um, and you know uh, we're we're learning other things as well. And just to give you an example. Um, it used to be the case before, you know, up until 15 years ago, um, outside of, let's say, the Netherlands, it was virtually impossible for kids to be able to access any of these um, drugs or surgeries. Um, and so if you wanted to transition, you had to do it as an adult. Um, and if you are a male um, undergoing vaginoplasty, um, <clears throat> uh, going through that procedure, have, have, having come through puberty um, intact your risk of uh, complication is much, much lower than if you were a male who had his puberty um, stunted or halted by puberty blockers, in which case you have not had a chance to develop um, a full male genitalia. And that's relevant because in a vaginoplasty, they use the male genitals, the, uh, the penis itself, they invert it, um, in, it into the cavity of the body um, turning it into um, uh, something that looks, that resembles a vagina. Um, and so if they can't use um, adult, you know, the, the, the tissue from a fully formed adult-sized human penis, they have to borrow tissue from elsewhere. Um, and the procedure as, as it exists uh, today is, is typically to borrow it from the colon. Um, and so essentially you're, you're taking part of the colon out, uh, turning it into um, this new... Um, pseudo vagina, um, and that carries huge risk of compl complication. Um, not just because the new organ that you're creating, um, you know, it, uh, you have uh, uh, secretions and smells and all these kinds of problems, um, but also because you're opening up a second surgical site, and that always carries a lot of risk. So, for example, in the Dutch study, which is often considered the gold standard of uh, medical research in this area, um, they had one death among their very small number of patients. And that death was because of a vaginoplasty from a patient whose pu a male patient whose puberty was blocked and they had to borrow from the colon. Um, so, so these are not negligible problems. They're, they're enormous problems. Um, and, you know, again, if you're talking about adults, um, let's say a 25-year-old whose brain has, has fully developed, because we know that cognitive development happens um, until around age 25, so if you're a 25, 26, 27 year old adult, you can fully grasp uh, and, and you're given all the relevant and accurate information about the chances of complications, the type of complications, what it would be like to live with those complications. Um, you know, you can make an informed decision. Um, I think there still are some ethical issues of do no harm that have to be considered. I, I, I don't think that that people can just, you know, consent away to, to anything they want. I think there, there should be some guardrails still um, I do support adult transitions, but but um, but but not without some guardrails. Um, but at least you're able, you're capable of understanding what it is that you're agreeing to. Um, the problem with my with pediatric transition is that we know, for example, that 93 to 98 percent of kids who go on puberty blockers go on to cross sex hormones, um, and once they're on cross sex hormones, the chances of them getting surgery also increase exponentially. Partly because if your body is partly female, but you're, you know, you've been on, on uh, puberty blockers followed by, by testosterone, um, your dysphoria could actually intensify, um, right? Because you are now you're kind of in this in-between category where your physical, natural um, body is, is pulling in one direction and the synthetic body you're trying to give yourself is pulling in another direction. And that actually creates internal conflict. Um, and so that can increase the likelihood that somebody like that is going to agree to um, to surgery that 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 person might not otherwise agree to so and of course the same goes for biological males um, so Putting kids on the medical transition path greatly increases the chance that they will end up on the surgical path as well even though um, When medical uh, professionals are explaining this to the public they tend to say that um, All these phases of treatment are totally separate and distinct and that you can agree to one um, and not even be bothered by the by the other until you know until uh, we have to cross that bridge. And that's just not true. I, okay, I agree with that. The reading I've done and the you know individuals that I've been able to contact, um, the treatment starts with let's change your pronouns and let's keep it a secret. And guess what? Everybody that 
tells Charlie that you now your name is Sue, you're wonderful. And anybody that says the opposite is a hideous person gets reinforced. And then the puberty blockers, then the cross-sex hormones, and the person's not any happier. And then it's the surgeries. And these surgeries do come, they come with infection. Uh, they come with a function, um, arousal, uh, erection, orgasm, menstruation. It's not going to turn you into the other sex. Um, the form. It's not going to look real. Uh, I'd especially encourage those that are considering the phalloplasty to look at what the outcome. <laughs> There's no gay man or a straight woman that's going to be attracted to that. Um, you're still going to carry the same chromosomes. Okay, you're going to have lifelong maintenance and you're not likely to be able to reverse the surgeries. And so these are serious consequences for a small part of the population, but certainly not something for broad uh, numbers of children. And the, the closest parallel, I, I'm a believer in history that if something's happening, something similar happened. And if you look at other attempts to treat mental illnesses and mental maladies, emotional problems with medical treatment, um, lobotomies draw a, a strong parallel. Um, Mostly it was children and women and those that were severely mentally ill that were being lobotomized and lobotomized without their knowledge. Um, in Sweden, there were 4,500 lobotomies performed between 1944 and 1966. Most of the patients were women and guess what? Parents, husbands, and doctors were able to order the lobotomy without asking the person whose brain was about to be dismantled. So asking a minor who would not be competent is just another parallel. And by the way, there were awards and um, international uh, acclaim for people that practice lobotomies. And now we view lobotomy as a uh, Frankenstein-like phenomena that never should have taken place. And when I look to Finland, Sweden, the United Kingdom backing away from their ardent pursuit of uh, gender affirming surgery, I just have to wonder, are we on the front end? Because again, I listen for that group coming to the fore saying, no, I missed the chance to do this transgender uh, change or transsexual change when I was 12 and my life's not been good. But we're not hearing or seeing that. Um, so again, it's a puzzlement to me. Um, I, I do believe as a society, we want to be kind and compassionate to everyone. I think everyone needs to be able to earn a living, uh, live in peace without violence. Um, but it just seems to me that, the, and I like the way you put it, the co-flating of uh, civil rights with a fairly experimental medical procedure is not the way to get there. Yeah, I agree with that. Lior, what didn't we talk about today that maybe we should have covered? And is there any ideas as far as like what good versus bad public policy might be? Sure. Um, I mean, there's plenty more that we could talk about, but let me maybe touch on two issues that I think are, are very uh, front and center in the news, very controversial. Um, one of them concerns the, qu the question of social transition. You raised kind of pronouns and stuff like that, right? So this, has been, this is now happening in schools all the time. Um, we get reports from parents. We see videos on social media being posted. Now, schools are not even hiding it anymore. They, they sometimes have this stuff written down explicitly in their, in their own internal policies. Um, you know, some schools have adopted what they call uh, gender support plans, which is where um, they basically defer to the child, no matter what the age, and they say, we will use your preferred name and pronouns, and we will ask you if to share that information with your own parents. Um, so let me just say a few words about that. Um, I think for the most part, um, and there's exceptions here, but for the most part, teachers and school administrators who do this are doing it because they think they're being kind and inclusive. They're doing it for good intentions. I think what they don't understand 
is that this is actually a psychological intervention that is likely to do more harm than good. Um, interestingly, other countries have recognized this already. Um, the Dutch have long recognized this. And again, the Netherlands is where pediatric transition comes from. And the Dutch researchers have actually always recognized that social transition is not just a neutral act of showing respect, but it's a powerful psychological intervention that can lock in a state of confusion or distress and turn it into a more permanent state of mind that would make medicalization more likely, whereas without the social transition, the child would have come to terms with their body and their sex um, and, and, and ver in all likelihood come out as gay. Um, uh, in, uh, in the UK recently, the uh, National Health Service issued new draft guidance in October of 2022, um, strongly discouraging social transition in children and in adolescents, um, saying that social transition should happen only on the basis of a gender dysphoria diagnosis and with the supervision of a mental health professional and informed consent, which really shows you that the NHS is, is, um, is, is taking seriously that this is not just a, a neutral show of kindness, um, but an active psychological intervention. Here in the United States, the picture is very different. Um, for the most part, the people who uh, run schools and dictate policy on this area are convinced. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, if I don't, if I forget um, um, to circle back to this, uh, uh, don't let me off the hook. But I, I can, I can explain why they're convinced. Um, but they're convinced that this is a neutral act of respect, and that, and that you know, parents should only be brought into the decision if the child agrees. If the child says, yes, my, my parents are going to support this decision. If the child says, no, my parents are not going to support it, the, the school can and should hide it from the parents. Um, here's what we know based on research, on over four decades of research. We know that in the vast majority of cases of children who have cross-gender feelings, behavior, and identification, um, they grow out of it by early adulthood. Um, something to the tune of 85% of them will come to terms with their body and their sex. Um, a majority of those will realize that they're actually gay um, and that their feelings of cross-gender identification are actu were actually early signs of same-sex attraction. Um, in 2022, last year, there was a, a, a research paper published by um, uh, Christina Olson. She's at uh, Princeton. Um, uh, showing that um, kids uh, at you know ages uh, I can't remember the exact average age there was something like um, I think it was six to eleven uh, it could have been uh, three to eleven I can't remember the exact age of ranges a uh, range of ages but um, kids who had cross gender feelings and behaviors who were affirmed socially meaning they were socially transitioned new name new pronouns and so on and so forth um, five years later. 94% of those kids had not come to terms with their uh, body and their actual sex, meaning they persisted in believing that they were either the opposite sex or some in-between non-binary category. Well, where would the support come from if they said, you know, that was a phase? And where could they turn to say, you know, I was Carl and now I became uh, Christina? Where's the backward migration path that said, you know, I, I've changed, I, I'm not sure about this. There's no place to go. Yes. I mean, especially in, in a, in a, in an affirming environment where the idea is that um, if a child has regret or changes her mind or anything like that, that that's kind of a telltale sign of what they call internalized transphobia, um, as opposed to, you know, just kind of a natural course of progression of gender dysphoric behavior. Um, but, but just to, to finish off the thought that I was starting earlier, you know, then the question is, okay, so wh what to do with this study? Because um, it seems to contradict four decades of research. Eleven previous studies have found that the vast majority of these kids desist. And here is one study that comes along and says, no, actually, almost all of these kids persist. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, activists um, in support of the affirmative model said, okay, th because this study is more recent, it supplants all previous research. Now, that's, you know, that's one interpretation, but it's by far and away not the most persuasive. Why? Well, um, the, the, the most important thing to know about these uh, 11 versus 1 studies was that um, in this latest study by Christina Olson, the kids, as I said, were fully socially transitioned, whereas in the previous studies, they were not fully socially transitioned. 
Um, and so one possibility, I think a much more likely possibility, is that uh, kids persisted in identifying as the opposite sex because they were socially transitioned, right? So if you're looking at this uh, without the critical distance that, that's required of a scientist, uh, if you're looking at this as an activist who believes in the idea of the transgender child and you believe that transgender children know who they are, then you're likely to say, yeah, of course. You know, if a trans kid says I'm trans and you believe them and you offer them support as being trans, then five years later, those kids are still going to identify as trans. Um, but if you're looking at this from critical distance, you say, all right, well, if, you know, if in the vast majority of studies, these kids desisted and came to terms with their bodies and, and with reality, but in the one study where they were socially affirmed as really being the opposite sex, they did not come to terms with their body in reality, then it's probably the social affirmation itself that's responsible for interfering with the natural resolution of gender dysphoria. I mean, that's just a, a common sense, um, you know, interpretation of how, of, of how do you reconcile this one study against the previous 11. Um, but that's not how it was reported. That's not what the authors said. Um, and that's not how journalists, um, kind of left of center media reported on this study. They said, you know, this is evidence that trans kids know who they are. Um, so that's the state of the debate. Now, you know, uh, 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 along with my colleagues at the Manhattan Institute, we recently authored an amicus brief um, for a, 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 a lawsuit, actually for a couple lawsuits, one in Massachusetts, one in Florida, dealing with secret social transition of children in schools. And by secret, I mean where the parents are either not um, informed or they are informed and say no, but the school go goes ahead and does it anyway. Um, and what we're trying to get people to understand is that this, again, is not a neutral act of kindness or respect. This is an active psychological intervention that can change the course of a child's development and put them on the path, on the medical pathway where otherwise they would not be, have to be on one. Uh, so it has potential to do enormous harm to children. Um, to say nothing of the fact that it should be well within the right of parents to make mental health decisions affecting the well-being of their children. Uh, that is not the role of the school, and it's certainly not the role of the school where teachers, um, uh, under extreme pressure from outside um, uh, lobby groups, um, think that it's their role to to decide which kids are really transgender for life and which are not. Well, you know, to that point, a lot of that is into the political realm and this great divide that we have today in the country. Um, in recent days, there's been an actress that's come forward and said, I have four children, one's gay, one's gender fluid, I think, and one's trans. And I'm, I'm looking at that and saying that defies every statistical probability. Okay, so this is not a naturally um, occurring event. Um, and, and to the point about the social transitioning, whether that's an act of kindness or it's an act of cruelty, um, it's an act of kindness if it's actually helping a person become who they are. However, if it's feeding into a underlying set of mental conditions, you're being cruel. Uh, um, I'll give you a great example. I was in a, a group and they wanted all the introductions with your personal pronouns. And I said, I, no, I just don't do that and should be able to tell by looking at me. Um, one person then identified used to be her. Now it's a they. And um, he said that because she has under uh, overlapping disabilities. And I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. So I looked up overlapping disabilities. And according to the VA, they don't exist. That you can't have overlapping disabilities. That, and basically that's a function of my lay understanding is if you've got anxiety and it's because of PTSD, you can't also have the anxiety because of childhood trauma or something like that. It's you'd have to be from the a separate incidence of P PTSD. So I think we're we're in the realm of what good mental health is as a starting point versus in the realm of biology and medical diagnostics and treatment. Um, I don't know how this ends. I don't know where this goes. Um, but I am concerned for the young people that are swept up in it today. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Look, again, you know, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't purport to offer medical advice. Um, what I do is fact check the people who do uh, make uh, statements about the science and the research on pediatric gender medicine. 
Um, you don't have to be a doctor. Again, um, if, if the citation that you invoke says the opposite of what you make it out to say, you don't have to be a medical doctor to call that out. Um, and that's exactly what's happened within the medical field. Um, but yes, I, I think we are uh, uh, staring down the barrel of a huge mental health crisis. We know um, based on data recently published by the CDC, there's a new book out by Jean Twenge, the social psychologist called Generations, where she um, documents a lot of the mental health collapse among um, Generation Z over the last decade and a half. I mean, it's, it's staggering. Um, we're seeing uh, skyrocketing rates of anxiety and depression, especially among teenage girls. Um, we are, we're going through a major mental health crisis um, uh, in, in American youth. And I think the, the, the transgender issue is very much downstream of that. It's a way for a lot of young people to try to make sense of the difficulty of growing up, of going through puberty, um, of being bombarded with pornography, um, of being sexualized. Um, it, it, it's, it's a coping mechanism in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, and, and, and the fact that our medical establishment takes those professions of being, um, so to speak, born in the wrong body at face value um, and, and starts from the, from the ideological premise that, tra that trans kids know who they are um, is frankly a, a medical scandal and one of the worst that I think that we've seen in, in, in recent memory. So, you know, you ask, where does it end? Um, you know, usually with, with these things in the United States, in the court of law, um, it's going to end with, with a, a generation of kids who grow up to be young adults who are uh, sterile, um, sexually dysfunctional, who have um, really bad health problems, whose mental health was not helped and probably harmed by being misdiagnosed as trans, whereas in fact they had other issues going on. Um, and, and it's a matter of time before these lawsuits succeed. There's already a few lawsuits underway. Um, one of the problems that we're running into is that judges, you know, you asked earlier, what about standards of care? Well, standards of care are forged in litigation. Um, and one of the problems is that, you know, when a judge is faced with a, with a claim of a, of a, a detransition or somebody who was harmed by these interventions, the judge will want to ask, okay, so what standards of care was the doctor following? And then you have most major medical associations like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health and the Endocrine Society, one by one, lining up behind the doctor saying, no, no, this was completely legitimate and, and, um, and, and you know, these procedures are science-based, evidence-based, um, and, and there's no problem with them. Um, so you know, one thing that, that desperately needs to be done is to help judges understand why the uh, policy statements and recommendations made by these medical associations are not based in science, um, that the evidence they themselves cite does not support their own conclusions and what European health authorities have done and why. And it's just a matter of time before judges who are, after all, intelligent people who live in this world with us um, come to appreciate that. And when they do, um, I think it's enough that you'll see a small handful of these multi-million dollar lawsuits against these big health systems. Um, and I I'm not going to say that uh, pediatric sex changes are going to come crashing down, but I think you're going to see um, the, the industry take a, a serious blow um, and things are going to come to a grinding, uh, a grinding stop. Well, I, I just want to see that all human beings get the right compassion and care. Uh, and it needs to be demonstrated that that is the right compassion and care. And again, I invite anyone that would like to be a guest on our show uh, to sit down and talk with us about why it, these pediatric sex changes or sex affirmations uh, are an act of kindness and compassion and in the best interest of the child. Lior, you've been a great guest today. So much to think about. Any closing thought for our listeners, readers, and viewers? Um, I guess what I would say is, uh, you know, this is a very, as you said in the beginning in the introduction, it's a very heated issue. Um, passions run very high. I would just uh, encourage your listeners to think about this, not just from a perspective of compassion and empathy, because as the word compassion suggests, it's a passion. It's not always rational or reasonable or evidence-based. And sometimes we need to rely on our reason and our understanding of the evidence um, to adjust our compassion and make sure that it's expressed in a way that's actually good for people and not destructive for, for the very people we're trying to benefit. Um, and so I would recommend anybody who's interested in this topic, 
um, that you really have a commitment to science, a commitment to evidence, um, to the scientific process of debate and inquiry um, above all. Um, and I think once, once we can get more people to be committed to the scientific process and scientific debate, I think we'll see this issue get resolved sooner rather than later. We've been talking today with Lior Sapir on the Common Bridge on the most sensitive topic, transgenderism, transsexualism, and pediatric health care. And this is your host, Rich Helpy, signing off on the Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on the Common Bridge. Subscribe to the Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.